be a very different kind of a day. Even the service itself is going to be very, very different. But uh, I'm excited about what Jesus is doing. Uh, we're going to have a great time this afternoon. There's amazing things planned throughout the entire day. So just, here's the deal. Plan on having a great time. If you're not having a great time, change your plan. Have a great time anyway. <laughs> okay, come on. Go ahead, buddy. All right. We're going we're gonna to do real simple on announcements here. Read your bulletin. <laughs> I'm just kidding. We're having our church picnic today from 1130 or right after service until 5 p.m. this evening. Uh, hope that you can all stay and join us. We want to make it a family affair. You're all part of the family, and we just want to have a good time. This coming week, on Wednesday, we're having family Christian ed classes from 6 to 7.30. And coming in June at Harvest Chapel, um, Pastor Lori's going to talk about it a little bit, but next Sunday, June 14th, we're having Sama Habib. Uh, she'll talk about it a little bit, but it's going to be an amazing time. Thursday, uh, Prophet School follow-up, Harvest Chapel Kingdom School of Living, and Seniors Ministry, Saturday, June 20th, four, or 6.30 to 7.00. Contact Sue Hope and uh, the 21st Youth Loft, Loft Service. Her hand up. 4.30. Did I? It is 4.30 to 7. You guys meet for a long time. That's awesome. <laughs> you got a lot to cover, right? <laughs> All right, so 4.30 to 7, and that's Sue. If you don't know who Sue is and you're one of our seniors, connect with Sue. She's an amazing lady. Um, ch uh, children's Ministry hot luck meeting uh, June 28th for volunteers. Um, the rest of it's in your bulletin, and take it from there. Read your bulletin and join, uh, and join us for the picnic, and we'll have a great time. Are you ready to have some fun? I think I am going to blow someone's ears out there. Okay, I'll whisper. Are you ready to have fun? It is going to be a fun, fabulous day here. I am telling you, there is something for everyone out there. We've got blow-ups for the little kids. We've got them for the bigger kids. We've got them for the teens. And we've got some for our seniors. We've got a little bit of everything. And we've got bingo, don't we, Sue? Out there under the Big Ten at 2 o'clock. I know she's got some fabulous prizes and lots and lots of food. Stick around. Get a name tag. Meet a new friend. If you know that's one of my biggest heartbeats, especially in this particular year, it is doing life together. If you saw that on the sign when you came in, that's what I think it's all about, is family with family. And I know some have family here locally, but some of you may be transplants here, um, and you're not from our community, and the only family you have is what is in this building right now, outside of maybe a few coworkers. So it's about being family because you saw the line up here just a few minutes ago a lot of people came up here because they were in need because they were seeking because they were looking because they just needed a touch from the Lord sometimes it's nice just to have that person that you can just share life with and just be family as Brian said Sama Habib if you do not have this book it's in the bookstore Pastor and I have been reading it this week. It is a life-changing book. It is her story of how she uh, was raised Muslim and turned Christian and how in the middle of a, uh, I'll just give you a little bit of excerpts, but in the middle of a church service, a suicide bomber came in and she was killed and she had a face-to-face -face with Jesus. But the early on stories of her testimony as a child and what it was like growing up and how she met Jesus. And she's got a black belt in uh, Taekwondo and karate and kai Kung Fu. And, and don't mess with her next week. I'm just telling you that. But I am so excited to meet her. This is just going to be a fabulous time. So pick this up. Before she comes next week, pick it up, read it this week, and I'm sure she'll sign it for you. Um, this is going to be a fabulous, fabulous time. Next week. Next week. Next week. There you go, Denise. <laughs> um, but it is, come next Sunday. And she's in both services, right, Pastor? 
the 915 and the 1115. So come on out and meet this woman and what it must be like. I, I, I'm excited. I, I just can't wait to, to just sit and share and just, just have a whole evening of just celebrating with her. I'll interrupt you real quick just to tell you this. Of course you will. We've had a lot of guests. I don't usually, not, not at this point, okay? But a lot of other times. But of, of, we have, we've had a lot of guests this summer. We have a lot of people coming. Uh, June 27th, Tom Stamen, really, really amazing prophetic voice, incredible guy. Rocked my world personally. But of all the guests that we've had, you know, Bob's been here and Steve's been here and different people. Will was just here. We've had a lot of neat people in, Todd, Dan. I'm probably as excited about Samoa as anybody that we've had. Um, people that she has impacted. Uh, Bill Johnson says she changed his life. That's a pretty good word when, when the guy that's changing the planet says this is a woman that changed his life. So some neat things there. I'm excited about her. That's going to be amazing. Saturday night's going to be awesome. There's an incredible speaker Saturday night. Uh, a good looking one, I yeah, think. Actually, um, Saturday night, I, I actually asked the Lord, and I'm, I'm believing for a Pentecostal explosion. Uh, I believe people are going to get baptized in the Holy Spirit on Saturday night. If you need the power of the Holy Spirit active in your life, don't miss Saturday night. Just come expecting because I'm actually preaching on the Holy Spirit. And I'm believing. I know it's a healing service. And, and you might say, well, what does that have to do with healing? Everything. Okay? And I'll, I'll tie it together. I, I can pretty well tie much of anything together if I have to have long enough. <laughs> okay? But, but I'm excited about Saturday night. I'm preaching on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Very, very excited about that. That's going to be a classic night. Sunday morning, though, will be incredible. So I just really want to encourage you. Make plans. If you, if you need to, make plans to double dip because uh, it's going to be a really, really good time. Go ahead. Okay. Um, we're going to get ready to uh, sow our seed. We're actually going to pass today because of the... Um, oh, okay. Uh, because of the, uh, uh, the, to redeem some of the time and the crowd and, and everything. But if you are a first-time visitor in our house this morning, we do have a welcome packet for you. We do have a gift for you at the end of service out at the Welcome Center. So if you raise your hand very high, one of our greeters will get to you quickly. So if the first time you've been in our house and part of our family, raise your hand very high. They're getting to you very quickly. And uh, we want to uh, give you a welcome packet and greet you and thank you for coming out and being with us and sharing with us. And it is going to be a fun, fantastic day. And these beautiful people up here are leaving soon, aren't you? Tell us just a little bit about what's going on here. Just a couple minutes. Miranda. <laughs> I'm, I'm following her lead. Okay. Just tell us. We're going to Hillside um, Intensive Worship School which is gonna be 15 to 16 days, and it's up in Harrisburg in Life Center, and it's their worship program that I went to last year, and it completely changed my life, and I really felt like the Lord was telling me to go again this year because of the instructors and stuff like that. It's just a wonderful opportunity to be under them and everything, so I, I bugged Jason to come with me. So awesome. she's, dragging, like, she's dragging me along. <laughs> so we're, we're going up there today, and then we'll, we'll be back until the end of June. So. All right. <laughs> I'll miss you all. Aww. Please take care of my wife and son. Please. But imagine what they're going to be sewed into that they're going to bring back and touch our lives here. I just love to know what is daddy doing and how they are going to be impacted for all of us. Yes. I'm excited. Not that I'm excited that you're leaving, but I'm excited that you're getting the experience. Uh, for what's getting ready to happen. So if you have your seed in your hand, Father, thank you for the opportunity to come into your house. Thank you, Father, that we get to just pour into our community financially with love, financially, Lord, with our means, Lord, just to pour into so many, into the nations, Lord. Father, we get to sow back. We get Get the opportunity to sow back into your kingdom. Thank you, Father, for this day. Thank you, Father, for all that has come out to just experience you, to worship you, to sing praises to you, to fellowship, to meet a new friend, to, Father, just do life together as your kids. Thank you, Lord, for this time and this day. Amen and amen. Woohoo! Okay, guys.
What kind of love is this that has overcome the world? What kind of love is this that can save us from ourselves? Thanks, guys. Thanks so much. You enjoy these guys? They enjoy you a little. Okay. <laughs> Amen. Feel good? Everybody doing all right? Cool. It's a good day. Well, today's going to be very different. We talked about this being a very different day because normally I, I would right now tell a joke. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, but would be excited about, about preaching and uh, what we purposed in our heart was that today was going to look a little different, and we were actually going to do some question and answer. So over the last couple of weeks, uh, you've had opportunity to write in some questions. And we got some good ones, and then we got some other ones. But uh, <laughs> as, as the case is, we're going to do our best to answer some of the questions that have come in. We're going to, we're going to uh, Nicole is going to be kind of like the moderator this I morning. I get to be Oprah. Yeah, yeah, okay. I'm the Oprah. Okay, okay. <laughs> Let's just pray about that right now. <laughs> but if you could write a check from Oprah's account. Anyway, <laughs> anyway um, but I, I, I think we're going to have a good time today. We'll kind of share our hearts a little bit about what all, uh, there'll be some historical stuff that's gone on in our lives. We'll share some of those kind of things. We'll talk about just some different things that have, I got it. And, no, we're good. We're good. I'll, I'll do this. Okay. Everybody good? Cool. It's we, different because he gets to sit down today. Yeah, this is really it's weird. Gonna I kill, tell you. It's going to be really, yeah. tra- really, really hard this, for We're him. not going to let him just stand and pace while he's answering his questions. I'm going to do that. Just Notice he didn't on. take a handheld, though. He still needed the ear mic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what it is. Okay. Well, we had gotten some great questions from the audience and ahead of time because we didn't want you to throw any stumpers at us. During the, during the actual talk show. Okay. <laughs> so I just wanted to start out by asking you guys, what did you want? Why don't you introduce yourself? Because there's some visitors here, and they don't know who you wonderfully are. I'm their daughter. Oh. <laughs> so 
So, Nicole. Yeah, so. Okay. Now, um, what did you want to be when you were growing up? What did you want to be when you grow up? Did you always want to be a pastor? Wow. <laughs> Farthest thing from my mind. Uh, for some of you, and some and you're of you, on a timer. Some of you do know my story, <laughs> but but I, I I actually I actually grew up. I was I was Roman Catholic, uh, raised in a very strict Roman Catholic home. Uh, we went to church every Sunday. I was about eight years old. I became an altar boy, and uh, and uh, from eight till almost sixteen. And then at sixteen, I became uh, the the moder- uh, What do they call that? There was a name. I read the scriptures for the priest at the eleven o'clock mass. Does that make sense? There was a name for that, uh, and, and and I did that for almost two years. Uh, I was uh, vice president of a youth group of a whole lot of kids, and we had a great time with that stuff. But as far as any any kind of uh, man, I never I never even knew what it was to be born again. I had no no mindset for what. what you know, people said you must be born again. I felt like Nicodemus, man. What are you talking about? That, that didn't even make sense to me. Uh, so, no, that was the farthest thing from my mind. Actually, uh, my goal was uh, at one point um, I wanted to run heavy equipment. I, I thought that would be really, really cool. I did get to do that for five years at Allegheny Ludlam Steel. I ran, uh, I ran 980s, 980Cs, which are some of the, big, uh, the biggest high lifts that uh, Caterpillar makes. So that was a dream come true for me. Ran backhoe and a couple other things. That's, I, I love doing that kind of stuff. Uh, but no, no desire to be a pastor whatsoever. What do you want to be when you grow up? What do you want to be when you grow up? Five feet. <laughs> and I am with heels. Okay. <laughs> I think when I, when I was little, when I grew up, you know what I really wanted to be more than anything? I wanted to be a mom. That's what I really wanted to be. I cool. wanted to grow up. I wanted, I couldn't wait. I wanted to get married, and I wanted to just have kids, and I wanted to be a mom, and I did, and I got to be She was a mom. very lucky. That's why God <laughs> gave her me. She's so lucky. She's so lucky. But okay. I did. I would just wanted, I wanted just the idea of being a mom, and now I got lots of kids. See how God does that? Yeah. And how tall are you? Here in church, in front of everyone. <laughs> Not what my driver's license says. <laughs> I'm probably like almost 4'11". Like, like, and almost. growing. Thank you. Um, but she can ride all the rides at Hershey Park. Okay. <laughs> it's a very exciting day. Now, you guys like to take a lot of trips. You're able to take some different trips and do some different ministry. And I would like to know, what is your favorite vacation or ministry destination that you have ever gone to? Wow. Wow. I guess if it's a favorite vacation, we have, we've been blessed, whether it was through ministry life or through um, just vacation life. We've done a lot of places. We've seen that Alaska is absolutely beautiful. We've gone from Alaska to Hawaii. And many of you know, many of you are coming with us to Israel, right? <laughs> many of you are coming with us to Israel, right? <laughs> um, but, um, you know, I think one of the favorite things that we did, if you remember, the kids were just the first time out of the house, and we were empty nesters. We didn't have a vacation plan that year. And I said, this is what I want to do. I want to get in the car, and I want to drive 81 South. And I want to see where the road takes us. I just want to drive. Where's the road going to go? We can stop where we want to stop. We can stay. We can eat when we want to eat. Just no destination. Let's just do it. I would have picked Italy. Well, I know. (laughs) Okay. But I think that was just spontaneous. It was just like, wow. What was yours? Um, Italy was amazing, but there's a, there is a there is a spiritual there's a spiritual connotation to that to be it because we actually stood in a in a place where I put my hand in the cell that held the Apostle Paul, you know, that's a pretty amazing reality. Walk the the actual cobblestones are still there that they would have led him out. They called it the Appian Way, but they would let him out to behead him. There's a church built where he was beheaded. But those cobblestones that were originally there 2,000 years ago are still there today. It was just absolutely phenomenal. So Italy, Italy was full of history and amazing. It was absolutely incredible. We, we preached for a conference and then went up to Rome for a couple of days. So that was pretty awesome. Uh, I love Sedona, Arizona. I think Sedona is probably the prettiest place I've ever been. I love that. 
All right, Pastor, you like to say a lot, and I tease you about it from time to time, that people are amazing, everyone's amazing, and I would like to know, who is the most amazing person you know? I'm just kidding, we know it's Nicole. Okay. And moving right on. <laughs> Was that a trick question? If we knew the answer, oh, everyone okay. knew, right? You guys knew <laughs> the answer to that one. All right, so if you could go back in time, and tell yourself one piece of advice, something that you have gleaned from your many years of wisdom, whether it is in life or ministry or both, what would you go back in time and tell yourself, which I think is advice that anyone could use, you know, what, could, what would you go back in time and, and wish you'd done differently? Or maybe just said, hey, this is how this is going to work out. It's going to be okay. What would you go back and tell yourself? Are you first? Wow. I think if I could go back, knowing now what I know, and going back there and learning some of the things, I would say, just relax. Just take it easy. I think growing up and learning in a, in a pastor's wife role, I was taught that everything had to be so. My house always had to be in perfect order because you never know when someone was going to come and knock on your door. My children always had That's true. To Josh folded the towels wrong once. It was traumatic. <laughs> Long story there. Not even going to go there. I remember that. <laughs> we had guests coming, and they had to fit a certain way in the cupboard. Come on, girls. How many you know? They only fit a certain way. Kathy's Thank you, Kathy. <laughs> and he folded them wrong and had to refold them anyway. But um, Pray, Praying for you, Gordy. Okay. <laughs> I think that is what I would, I would tell myself, to it's okay that... Just relax and enjoy every moment. Enjoy the kids. Enjoy the, the trips. Enjoy the relationships of the people around you. Don't get all caught up on everything being a certain way, done a certain way, done a certain time, because that's what was you know, in, put in my brain as a pastor's wife you know, you have to look like this, and you have to go here, and you, you have to, you have to, you have to. And, wow, that's, I think that's what I try to teach some of my women leaders now. Just enjoy life. I mean, yeah, you still have to do, and there's still order to things. I mean, you can't run amok, but whatever that means. But um, you uh, just enjoy. Just enjoy the journey. Good word. <laughs> Do you have any words of wisdom for us, Pastor? I think this is a great question. It, it is a really good question, and, and probably everyone in, in the congregation today, you stop and think with me for a minute, what would you, what would you do differently? Because you know, we can all think about that, and sometimes we have the pat answer, oh, I would do everything just the way I did because I learned from my mistakes and I learned from what I did right. And you can stop and think that way. The truth is we'd all change a few things. Uh, if I was to give wisdom to the idea, go back 30 years and stop and rethink, because we're 30 couple years in ministry, we moved around a lot. Uh, we were doctors in the uh, church doctors like churches that got tore up we kind of went in got them healed up went to another one that was tore up went in got it healed up went to another one I would say this above everything value relationships uh, to me that was really really important because what I found was if we were if we were in Newville and we went from Newville to Allentown and we went from Allentown to to, uh, to Waynesburg went from Waynesburg to Adam Station over to Battle Creek and we moved around all the different places um, it seemed like if when I when I left this area and went to this area, my focus was so much here that I didn't maintain the relationships that were valuable back here. Because you know why? Your full focus in your, was everything was here. And I found that probably, I think if I had to redo it over again, I'd try to stay a little more connected to some of the people uh, because I think those relationships, God ordained some of those. And I probably didn't place a high enough value on some of those because I was focusing on the next one rather than holding on to the last one. I hope that makes sense. Hmm? Pat, it does. It's good. Good. Pat, good job. Thanks. Thank you. You didn't get an applause, okay. but <laughs> I think your audience dropped the ball. It's, it's okay. I know who I am. They meant I to. I now. didn't have my car <laughs> flash. All right. <laughs> mm. Now, you're a very energetic preacher. You like to make our cameramen dizzy by running the steps back and forth. And, and I can tell you that he's always been that way my whole life, always been that way. So I wanted to know if there was a story that you'd like to share in, in your many churches with different steps. 
Perhaps, have you ever had a misstep, even while under the influence of the Holy Spirit? <laughs> That's a setup right there. <laughs> Some of you might know this story, but uh, it was probably around 1991, 92. Uh, we were in Battle Creek, Michigan, and uh, it was a different crowd of people. The, 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 um, we had pastored a lot of uh, a lot of. Uh, wonderful people, a lot of different churches. This church was a little different in that a lot of the people were business people. Uh, so there was, you know, a lot of three-piece suits. And we all wore suits and ties in that era. And, um, but they, they all, all the guys wore cowboy boots. And I'd never wore cowboy boots in my life. So I thought, I'm going to get me a pair of them cowboy boots. Because, you know, when you're in Rome, you know what I mean? Come on, I've become all things to all men. So I got, I'm talking about a nice pair of cowboy. These were sharp. They were gray, little red stitching all through them. You know what I mean? Had that little silver point, you know, like so you could kill cockroaches and, and, <laughs> and whatever. But, but they were fancy boots. So I bought them like on a Tuesday. And I thought, I'm not even wearing them because I wanna, I'm going to save them for Sunday. So I went over and the church had several steps like this one going up to the platform. And I always moved around a lot. You know, and I put these brand new on. I didn't even wear them across the parking lot because I didn't want to scuff them up. I paid a lot of money for these. They were sharp looking. I put them on. I thought, man, these are sharp. People noticed them right away. I pulled my pant leg up to show my boots off, you know what I mean? And, and I was laughing with them. Well, we went through worship. I got up front. I'm starting to preach. And, and I moved around then like I do now. And I started down the steps. And as soon as I hit about the first step, them cowboy boots are really slippy on the bottom, but nobody told me this thing. And I went shoom and boom and right down on the floor. And I'm laying there, and my first thought is, I wonder if anyone noticed. <laughs> uh, so, ah, we're going to skip that idea. And, and I got up, and everybody knew I was all right, and then they started laughing. What I realized afterward was if I'd have hit the floor and just started speaking in tongues, revival would have broke out right there. <laughs> oh, it's the Holy Ghost. It would have been a great time, but I missed it. Okay. <laughs> It's different when you saw it in person. <laughs> Do you remember it, Keith? <laughs> <laughs> um, now that you pastor Harvest Chapel, it is your full-time job, and you work from early morning till night, helping people with many, many things. But it hasn't always been your only full-time job. You've had many full-time jobs. Sure. And I think that there's probably a great multitude here who don't really know that it took a long time to get to the point where this could be your only full-time job. Mm -hmm. What else did you do? Wow. Well, if you mean while I was, while we were in ministry or even Yeah, before? while you were in ministry, how did sure. you, cause you had to balance a lot of things and mm -hmm. I just thought that was something you could share about. Um, I've been in construction most of my life. I, I learned drywall uh, when we were over in Newville, uh, one of the families that was part of the church there. And Delanor comes here a good bit, but he's actually the guy that taught me how to do drywall. So a lot of the ministry, I drywalled houses and different things like that because I've always been kind of construction-based and I've always enjoyed that. Uh, but honestly, man, you did whatever you had to do to keep the wolf away from the door. Drove school bus for several, well, for probably two years. I drove school bus. I enjoyed that. I love driving school bus. That was kind of neat. I, uh, <laughs> um, boy, there's some stories on that school bus, but I'll leave them alone. <laughs> okay. Um, sold insurance for a combined insurance company where you went door to door selling accident policies. Anybody ever, you know what I'm talking about? It come and sold the accident policy. Then when people didn't want to renew, you said, okay, but you never know what's going to happen. As soon as you don't sign this paper next week, you know, you're going to fall and break your leg. Boy, was that horrible, but it worked. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, but I didn't know then what I know now, or I'd have never done that. Uh, worked for Metropolitan Life selling insurance company insurance for them. I uh, did a lot of different things, worked in the steel mill. Again, when I left the steel mill, then I ended up going back to the steel mill several years later because, and, and can I say this? Heckin Engineering is, a, is an international company. They got uh, co companies in like 13 different countries, and I'm the only employee that they ever rehired because they have a no rehire per policy. So I felt pretty good about that. Um, but a bunch of different things because you do whatever you got to do to keep the wolf away from the door. So. All right. I didn't know if that was next to me or, okay. Um, I think that uh, mostly I worked in banking. I was in um, finances for 17 years and uh, never really thought I would end up there because I hated math in school. <coughs> you know, loved English, loved history, but I didn't like two plus two. That just didn't seem to work for me. But ended up, same thing, um, after the kids went to school because I stayed home. 
with my kids while they were in school. But once they went to school, it was like, okay, what am I supposed to do now? And um, started, got a part-time job as a, as a teller in a drive-in at a bank. And um, just kind of worked my way through that. Really fell in love with the financial world and the banking world and what does that look like. And moved here to Pennsylvania after we left Michigan and uh, fell into a, a, a banking company and a multi-billion dollar company and really loved what I did. Went through a lot of from, from tellers to customer service um, into management and uh, ended up as the assistant director of marketing for the company. And it was really nice because I had a billion dollar a year budget and I got to spend it. I had fun. <laughs> You don't anymore. I don't anymore. <laughs> you guys don't give me a billion, a million no. dollar a year budget. I don't know. But um, it was really fun, and I, I, I loved um, that whole, that whole era and time of my life. But uh, in 2003, um, our life kind of took a shift then, and uh, I stepped out and quit my job and said, "Okay, let's see what God's going to do." And we were both full time in the ministry and had to. We learned some things. Well, there. that does lead me to my next oh, okay. question. So it's kind of perfect. All right. Good build up. Oh, thank you. I was trying. <laughs> Can you tell me what was a defining moment in each of your lives? Because we all have many defining moments every day, every season of life. What was the biggest defining moment in your life? Well, yeah, there, you're right. There's many. When you look back and you think of different things that shape you and, and change you and stuff. But. I would say one of mine would have been when I left the secular workforce and became pastor at full time and uh, knew what does that look like to work every day with your spouse. How about it, Jody? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we can, we'll share stories. Um, but it was, I think it was for both of us, you know. Oh, Be yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but... Uh, it was, you know, but I, I absolutely love it. I love, you know, what we do and making the function of the, of the ministry and the house work and, and now getting more involved in community. So I think that was one of many defining moments was when I totally left the secular world and took this role on full time. Yeah. Papa? Um, she's right in the idea that there's several defining moments. I, I would tell you that Primarily, the first defining moment was the night I received the call of God to, to step into pastoral ministry. Um, it was a Sunday night in, in, in January, uh, probably 1980, I would think. It was shortly after we were married, and I went to an altar to pray, and on that night, I knew God called me to be a pastor. I got up, I went to the altar with no clue whatsoever and got up from the altar with no doubt whatsoever. I knew that God had called me and gave me a shepherd's heart on that night. And I could take you right to the spot, show you the time, tell you who prayed with me, all the different things that happened. But it was a defining moment in my life. I knew beyond every shadow of a doubt that was happening. Uh, several other defining moments. And I think sometimes God orchestrates things. Um, I, I would tell you one of the defining moments was a lunch I had with Pastor Dan. And it was the day that I asked him to come on staff here, and he agreed to that. That changed my life. That was a life-changing moment for me because our relationship founded a whole lot of things in my life. Um, uh, defining moments. The book I got uh, when uh, I picked up a, a book for a lady from the church here who uh, wanted me to pick up a book. It was in January, maybe nine years ago. And uh, it was Miles Monroe's book called Rediscovering the Kingdom. I never understood the terminology that he used and when I realized it, started searching the scriptures, it changed my life forever. So there are whole bunches of different things that, are, that will define. And sometimes, and honestly, I think for every one of us, I think God orchestrates some things that we're not even aware of. And it's people that he brings into our life or circumstances or situations that we have to walk through that we might not even understand at that moment. But you look back and go, oh, my goodness, if that had never happened. You know, even even when we began Harvest Chapel, it came off the catalyst of something that I thought was was probably traumatic, was actually a, a catalyst to bring us to the place where Harvest was formed, and it, it was a defining moment. So those kind of things happen. 
that I think are absolutely phenomenal and, and can be absolutely life-changing. We may not realize that it's a moment but when you look back with hindsight, you go, oh my gosh, if that didn't happen, this wouldn't have happened. And if this wouldn't happen, we wouldn't be where we are. So even when, again, just like when we had an altar service earlier on today, when you're, when you're walking through challenging things, you might realize that it could be the catalyst to the greatest blessing you've ever received in your life. And because God orchestrated it and called you into ministry, it's always been easy. Because that's how God works, right? The only challenge we ever had is we never knew what to do with all the money. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, okay. <laughs> sure. <laughs> and pa- I'm supposed to call you dad. Go ahead. I'm going to call you pastor. It's killing me. I gotcha. <laughs> all right. What is your favorite thing to do to relax? Probably fishing. I, I love to go fishing, and, and uh, it's just uh, the earth is two thirds water and one third land, so we should fish twice as much as we work. <laughs> it's God's word, okay? <laughs> but uh, but uh, I, I thoroughly enjoy that. That's a good relaxer for me. Now, Mom, I know that most people here would like to joke and think that your favorite thing is shopping, but that's not a true story. What is your favorite thing to do to relax? I don't mind shopping, but I'm really not a shopper as much as everybody thinks it is. Um, I like to get in my car and put the roof down and drive. I don't care where I go. I don't care when I go. I just fill up the gas tank. That's why my car's little. And just drive. It's like go back roads, go highways. Where's the road going to go next? You know, you're driving down the road, and you always say, I wonder where that road goes. Well, find out. And you go that way. Um, and I always tell uh, friends that get in the car with me, I'll say, all roads lead home. Because before Kim Miller really knew me, um, I'd say, come on, Kim, let's go for a ride. Well, where are we going? Well, I don't know. Well, when are we going to get back? I don't know. Well, what if we get lost? Oh, we won't. See the sun? Because where the sun sets in the west by our house, so as long as the sun setting in the west we're good i'd freak her out so much fun but i love to just get in my car and drive because if you keep your eye on the sun you're never lost you always know your way home in the spiritual and in the natural so just keep your eye on the sun and just go all roads all roads lead right back home. (laughs) This is confusing for me because I cannot tell when the sun is rising and setting and it's always in a different direction for me. (laughs) She's been telling me this my whole life, but I just get lost. I need a GPS to get anywhere and I don't know how you people got around with maps. (laughs) Prior to the GPS was created, I, I don't understand it. Could you tell us, could you tell us what is your favorite book of the Bible? I have about 66 of them. (laughs) Obviously, but there has to be one that's like the the one that's, I don't know, when you're just having a day and you just want to sit down and just read more for pleasure. Probably James. I I read James a lot. I love the book of James. At one point, I committed it to memory, uh, but I I love the book of James, so I'm going to go with that. Because James is a straight shooter like your daughter. By the way, who was your favorite member of the family again? Yeah. Walt. Your mom. (laughs) Walt is the one who told me to ask that question. (laughs) See, because he knew I was going to say him. (laughs) I think my favorite uh, book of the Bible is, um, well, I have a couple, but probably I absolutely love Esther. I love... Because it's about a queen. It is. That's right. It's about a queen. It's about royalty. It's about all of that. But you know, she stepped out. She is such a woman of power and authority. And if she didn't step out and do what she did, the Jews would have been annihilated. And where would the lineage of Christ, I know God is God and he would have found another way, but look at what she did. You know, she said, I will go. And it's just the power of what and who she became. And just, I just, I love the book. And understanding that we as women can reach that same authority and power and, and, and anointing and gifting and just walk it out and just be great women of God. And 
I love, I love Esther and what she represents. There you go. All right. <laughs> we had gotten this question in, so I'm going to ask it. Okay. Um, Harvest Chapel is a very forgiving church, and we promote love and restoration. If we claim to be a forgiving church, why is it that we run background checks for our volunteer staff? I guess I'll go that one since that's more of an administrative question. It's that's an kinda, administrative question. I know. I feel, felt that one coming. Um, actually, uh, I understand on the of the line of the um, forgiveness and love, and that is very true. And and our motto has always been: um, we don't care about your past and where that is, but we care about your future. But we're also governed by laws, and under the laws of Pennsylvania, they require that um, we do background checks on all of our volunteers that deal with children. Now, if you don't deal with children and you're in working in the kitchen, we don't, we're not governed by that, so we don't do that. But if you have anything to do with the children within the house, it um, has to do between Megan's law and the government law, and, and daycares do it, which I think you even know because you own Tumblebus. But um, anything that has to do with children, that's the law of the government. And you know what? we honor law. We honor um, our government. Um, may not agree with everything, but we still honor that. And uh, we go by what the law requests of us to do. So we do. I was debating if I was going to add to that. <laughs> You're free to express yourself, daughter. And also because we don't have the right to reserve judgment, so we don't actually know the condition of anyone's heart. So it's always responsible to make sure that our children are safe, regardless of what people's words are versus their actions. And so we are required, but we also are not passing judgment in positive or negative ways. <laughs> so, um, now you guys said you've worked together for many, many years, and you've been together and been married for how many years? Pastor, go ahead and answer that question. How many years have you been married? 35, 36 in August. Woohoo, he got yes. it right. <laughs> <laughs> and what would you say is a key ingredient or um, something that you practice that has made your marriage strong and would be a good example for anyone trying to be married for 36 years or more? Uh, I took her to the Bahamas on our 25th anniversary. Never mind. Okay. <laughs> um, it's a joke. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, actually, and, and very, very honest, um, I think one of the keys to a healthy marriage is, is really, because I do so much counseling as well, it's, it's healthy communication. It's, it's being able to share your heart, being open, uh, being able to, to be very transparent with one another, to communicate feelings. To, beyond the, how was your day, how was your day, that, that's all important, but actually to go deep into your feelings and be able to share openly and honestly, listen, man, when this happens, it causes me to feel this way, and I know it's not your fault, but I want you to know this is what happens. And if we can learn how to do that and communicate better, that's probably the greatest key to healthy relationships, whether that's in marriage or any other relationship, by the way. And what do you guys see coming in the future, possibly, for Harvest Chapel? Where do you see us going in the future? We've started in the plaza. We've come up here and built. We've expanded to the point that we really can't expand on this property anymore because we're, we're landlocked at this point. What does the future hold for Harvest? Do you want me to go ahead? Go ahead. You go for it. You've been chomping it to bit. <laughs> there's, there's two things that are coming up real soon and these are these are very very important things for the whole congregation um the lord spoke to me about june being vision month and i'll be preaching on casting vision and, and and catching vision i started talking about nehemiah because he was a visionary if you've been in the last several weeks i've been preaching from nehemiah because of the vision that was in his heart and, and their ability to build um what the lord spoke to me about and, and please hear this the right way for years 
I, I was never about like church planting and all that kind of things because I just felt like the Lord called me to pastor and this is what I'm doing and I'm, I'm trying to follow that. I feel like there's probably more of an apostolic anointing. We could talk about that. I, I don't want to go into that in too much detail. What I want to tell you is that I feel like the Lord has spoke to my heart probably November into December uh, into the very beginning of the year, just really kind of struggling with my heart on this. But for the next, over the, I feel like we have a, a, a long-term plan, and the long-term plan would be that over the next several years, we'll plant four more churches. Uh, we'll actually have Harvest North, East, South, and West. And I feel like Harvest North will be up toward Carlisle. Harvest West will be out toward Cashtown. Harvest East will be out between East York and Hellam, and, uh, or Wrightsville in that area, and, and then uh, Harvest South down toward Westminster. And I feel like it's something the Lord has really spoke to my heart about. And here's why. We're raising up leaders around us constantly. And I feel like there's some incredible people with great gifting that are coming up. So you take a man that it feels like a pastoral anointing on his life, a calling to pastoral ministry. And as we're raising him up and teaching him and pouring into him, what do we do with him after that? Where do we put him? How do we, how do we, how do we help to develop that and cause that man to be able to grow and to flourish? I feel like the Lord is saying, as we're continuing to plant churches, we're raising up, we're raising up pastors, we're raising up worship leaders, we're raising up uh, people who are, who, are, who are active in certain ministries, and this is going to create a place of, of, of availability for them. And, and I, I really, really believe, because it was something, and, and honestly, I even struggled with it for months because it was never something that was in my heart to do. And then I realized, man, this is the will of God, and here's why. And it was to find that place where we can help people to step into the, their ministry, their callings, their destiny, whatever it is that God has. So we're going to begin the process of that. We're asking the Lord to open the door. I've already talked to some intercessors that are praying into that and saying, Lord, where's the first steps of that? What does that look like? But over the next several years, I think what we'll find is we'll do We'll, we'll plant a church. We'll try to strengthen it for a year. And then we'll see about planting the next church, strengthening it for a year, and see what the Lord does. I feel like it will. every house will have with it its own. I'll share with you. It, let's assume that there's, we'll go, let's go 10 years into the future, and all five churches are flourishing. Uh, at the beginning of the week, the pastors would come together. We would sit. We would say, how was the weekend? Kind of walk through any problems together. Where are we going to go from here? In that next, during, that, during that time frame, whether that's in a, a conference call or whether that's a face-to-face -face meeting, uh, it would be, okay, what's next Sunday going to look like? Because whether you go to Harvest East or Harvest West, North, South, or Central, you would continually have the same message preached. It might be preached with a different flair. It might be preached from, and, and each pastor would have the ability to go down and rabbit trail and go wherever they want to. I don't want it to be one, you know what I mean? But the theme of the message would stay the same. That keeps the theme of the house the same. It keeps the message kingdom-minded. It keeps everything. So if you went north and somebody else went to the south and you guys met at Walmart, you would both have, like, let's just say we're going to preach Luke 15. I'm preaching Luke 15. The other pastors would be preaching Luke 15. The message would stay central. We'd have a syllabus to follow, but it wouldn't be like a word-by-word -word written thing. It would just keep the message central. Uh, the worship leaders would have their own freedom to worship. Everybody would be able to. I didn't want to do the whole thing where they teleprompt the message in because it seems like that would be too confining. Because if in one church the Holy Spirit broke out and, and it was just going on and on, man, let's just let God do his thing. I don't want to put any constraints on that. You know what I mean? I feel like there's an open for that, and that's, that's something that's really, really powerful in my heart. I feel like it's something God's speaking, and it's saying, Lord, what do you want to do with the future of harvest? What would that look like? And I feel like that that's a place that God's really, really prompted my heart, prompted my spirit. People come to Harvest Chapel because of the message of the house. I feel like we have a unique message. I feel like our message here is unique to the community. And the only way I can find to get that into other communities is probably to be planting churches in those communities and reaching the people that are in that area. I'll, we actually have people that drive an hour and 45 minutes, two hours, some, a whole bunch of different people drive an hour, hour and 15 minutes. And, and that's an unusual thing. That doesn't happen a lot, especially in South Central Pennsylvania. But what we're finding is, is that God is doing that because of the message of the house. So if we were able to take this message out into other areas, I feel like it, we could draw more people to keep the message central because I feel like we have a unique message that people need to understand if you've been coming here very long at all you know 85 90 percent of what I preach is identity because people need to understand who they are in Christ they need to understand sonship the finished work of the cross they need to understand more than anything there who 
who God created me to be and then flowing in that creative value. What's this new creation reality all about? And as we continue to pour that into people, I think it creates a hunger. I think there's a lot of people that are hungry for that. And uh, so the idea of planting five, four more churches over the next little while, I feel is something that God's really, really spoke to my heart about. We're going to see what that develops like. And we're just praying into it as we do. So I'd encourage you to pray with us about it. And let's see what God opens up. Okay? Feel good about that? Good. See, they, they clapped for me this time. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. What is your favorite restaurant? Oh, really? Wow. I love my wife's cooking. <laughs> <laughs> we're we don't condone lying <laughs> pastor actually actually the truth is, most of you know we eat out all the time but the truth of the matter is pastor Lori's an amazing cook oh she really is yeah yeah i remember many a crock pot meals in my <laughs> but they were amazing they were great <laughs> keith you yeah <laughs> <laughs> Because um, oh, oh. I was expecting a different answer. I was expecting you to say Longhorn, because that is the one you frequent the most. Are we allowed <laughs> to say that on air? Oh. Longhorn Mangus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Steak salad. Yeah, you oh. can't die happy if you oh. haven't had a steak oh. salad from Mangus Diner, yeah. man. Okay. <laughs> yeah. There you go. You need, I said if God go came down and said you could only eat one thing for the rest of your life, my answer would have been the Mangus steak salad. That would have been my answer. <laughs> so, okay, go out to the parking lot, hang a right, go through the Abbottstown Circle, and it's a little diner right there. Mm. If you've not had a Mangus steak salad, now not today because there's a picnic, but some Sunday after church, you go up there and you tell them harvest sent them, I'm telling you. Or other days as yeah. they are open throughout well, that's the week. True. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's talk about water baptism. Mm -hmm. We do we do offer, you know, the baptismal here, but we haven't in many years. So I, I don't remember anyhow. You'll have to refresh my memory if I'm wrong. It rarely happens. Um, we haven't been to the creek. We used to go to a creek. Sure. Have we been to the creek in a while, and do you plan to revisit the creek as like a special thing for people who find the creek very spiritual? I would tell you if somebody had it in their heart to get baptized. In the, like we baptized uh, behind the Bermudian Church of the Brethren. Anybody, anybody go with me back here? It's, it's absolutely gorgeous. It's on a place where the, where the Conewago actually makes a bend right there. It's absolutely beautiful. I love that. That's a, that's a beautiful thing. If somebody said, man, I don't want to get baptized inside. I want to get baptized outside. I have no problem with that at all. I'm not doing it in February. <laughs> That's the house pastor's job in February. <laughs> He's actually out house pastoring right now. But, so. uh, but yeah, I'd be more than glad. I, how, how many of you have been baptized outside? Because that, that's pretty awesome. I, that, to me, that's a, it's a great experience. I, I, we've, I've baptized a lot, a lot of people in creeks and streams and ponds and different places. I think in 35, 36 years, we've only lost two. No, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> but, but, uh, but it's absolutely beautiful, man. It's absolutely beautiful. So, yeah. I enjoyed it when we went to the Y. We, a couple years back, we, we had oh. a big, we went to the Y, and we had a bunch of families. Yes, and we, and, we, and we did baptisms as families and as couples, and, and I liked it. I thought that was pretty, pretty special. It's probably actually, been a long time. Yeah, we actually had over 100 show up that, I remember that night, and it was really cool. Families got baptized as families. I remember couples that had been going through marital problems, right. and they were rededicating their marriage, and they got baptized together. And that was, that was really cool. Yeah, mm -hmm. we'll have to maybe think about that again. But it was cool because they closed the Y down, closed it at 6 o'clock on uh, Saturday, Sundays. Sunday. And they, we rented it. And so it was just us and the whole why. And it was, it was really cool. Yep. Actually, what was really cool, the lifeguard got his world changed. Yes. His yes. parents yes. lived in our little development. We only have a little development with about 10 or 11 houses. And uh, his, his parents lived there. His mother actually walked down, knocked on our door, shared with Lori how the lifeguard, because they had to have a lifeguard, right? It's interesting you have to have a lifeguard for a baptism. But anyway, <laughs> boy, that'd probably preach. Anyway. <laughs> 
but but uh, got his whole world rocked, man. What happened was because there was a whole bunch of us baptizing. Lori and I were baptizing people together. Dave and Kim were baptizing people together. Dan and Todd were there, and they were baptizing people together. Todd ends up getting a word for the lifeguard, starts speaking over him, prophesied over him. The lifeguard is totally wrecked. He says, and and she said two weeks later, and he still couldn't get past. It's all we talked about. She said for he just he'd break out into tears and start crying because he had never experienced God like that. Yeah, I love that stuff. That's fun. But that was a really unique experience, man. It was just an amazing, amazing time. Mm-hmm. And I know that God has shown up in your lives in many ways and answered many prayers. I would like you to share an example of a personal miracle or a way that you have just seen God and been like, that was so God. I know it's happened many ways, many times. I just want you to share a story with us about something significant that happened that you just, you know, just evidence, just a testimony of a miracle in your life where you saw God totally show up, you knew it had to be him, and he just answered the prayer of your heart that time. Mom? I see, I see you processing. I'm processing. That wasn't a prep question. She's not ready no. for that. <laughs> I'm processing. When I give you the blank stare, it's because I'm thinking. He always says, I don't know if you're off into the world or are you thinking or what are you doing because I just stare at you. Um, well, yeah, you're right. There's, there's, wow. I could sit for a while, though, and talk about lots of answered prayers. But I think when you asked me, the first thing that popped in my mind was the um, motorcycle accident. And um, when some of you know the story and some of you may not, but uh, about 10 years ago in August, we were in a rather bad motorcycle accident. And um, he was left on the road dead. And um, they had put me on a gurney and was putting me in the helicopter to lifelight me to uh, York Trauma Unit. And that was a defining moment. But I remember praying and saying, I now truly understand total um, release to you, Father, total control. You always say that, God, you have total control. God, it's all yours. And we say that. And we really mean it. But in that moment, I truly understood what it meant to give total control and release because of so many things. Um, To the best of my knowledge, when I was wheeled away, my husband's dead. I have children still Josh was still at home. Um, um, Nicole's eight, nine months pregnant with Kylie. um, And we have a ministry. And, you know, uh, my parents were still alive. So there was a lot of facets going on in my mind at that moment. And I'm thinking, okay, God, it's totally yours. My life is now totally, totally committed to you. It's yours. Whatever you want, life or death, whatever the situations. And that was when I can say it was total right now. And then being wheeled away into the helicopter and just to give you a brief ending of the story, he was You're okay. Yeah. <laughs> he wasn't dead. Um, but um, the Lord totally miraculously blew down life on us and uh, we didn't even spend one night in the in the hospital, they released us the next morning to go home. But I believe it was because I truly understood at that moment what it's like to say, my life is yours. Do we still have situations that come up in our lives, in our ministry, in our family, in our finances, in our health? Sure do. But the Lord always reminds me of my helicopter ride. And I think if I can do that in that helicopter, then, Lord, it's totally, there's nothing else. It's yours. Pretty cool. Do you have one you want to share? That was, you would have went with that one, too. I, I slept through that. Yeah. <laughs> he, doesn't, he does no recollection. I woke up in the hospital. I don't remember anything. <laughs> but uh, this... You know, they, they share that. There's so many different things. You know, we've seen a lot of miracles. I, I've prayed for three different people that had blind eyes open. That, 
that freaks me out. That's just a pretty cool thing. And uh, uh, I've seen God heal a lot of people. I've seen a lot of things happen. To me, the most powerful miracle is when you see people's lives transformed. Uh, you know, that's that's amazing. And you you watch people that uh, that didn't didn't know God at all, and today are they're on fire for Him and changing the world. You know, those kind of things to me are very very exciting. I I think the power of God to transform a life is the most amazing thing we can see. Um, I need to share something real quick if I can, just because in, in line with that, and I'm just kind of honoring the time, but I look at my life because I know what my life was before I met Christ. And, and for those of you that don't know this, I'll share this part of the story. Um, I met Pastor Lori in a, uh, uh, a department store. It was called, it was called Murphy Mart. And, uh, she was working there as, a, 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 a one of the, not, wasn't the, yeah, sales clerk, just you know, out on, out on the floor, and uh, I was a stock boy when they did the uh, when they did the initial um, uh, where they bring everybody into the personnel for the orientation. Uh, I, I felt as a good stock boy, I should go check out the new stock, uh, <laughs> so I did. And, and I was with another stock boy, and the first time I saw her, I said, "Oh, she's cute. I'm gonna marry that girl." I didn't know at 17 I was prophetic, uh, <laughs> but uh, but. Uh, I guess, and, and, and so what happened was, uh, I actually met Lori on August the 13th. We got engaged on August the 17th and married on August the 18th. Uh, but it was over two years. So, <laughs> so uh, but, but, but on that day uh, we met, I, I was far away from God. She grew up with some of the best parents the, the planet's ever known. Uh, Mom and Dad Bobbert were just amazing, amazing people and uh, absolutely in love with Jesus. So Lori grew up in a very holiness home, very strict home, has always known and loved Jesus. That's a big deal because sometimes when you hear the testimonies of how God radically changes a life, you know, uh, like Todd, so you, guys, you guys are all familiar because Todd shares his testimony quite a bit. But we see that we think, oh, that's so powerful. I wish I had a testimony. Can I tell you something? Her testimony is stronger than his. And I want you to understand, because he can tell you the power of God to change a life, but she can tell you the power of God to keep a life. And I think that testimony is absolutely phenomenal. And, and I've watched God, that is, that's an amazing thing. And I've watched God do that, you know what I mean? And, and, and honestly, uh, we, were, we, we, were, we were at a place last night, and, and, and Miranda talked about being raised in Harvest Chapel, you know what I mean? And it, it, in case you didn't know, I absolutely love this girl. So, but, but I think about her life, and I've watched God work through her because I believe that one day she'll minister to, to, to hundreds of thousands, and I, I actually believe that. But she'll have the testimony of, God, I was raised in a Christian home. God kept me in a Christian home. He has raised me and he's been the Lord of my life all my life. I think that's a great testimony. And we need to celebrate those testimonies just as much. You know what I mean? I think that's huge. Um, but when God, when God turns a life around and people get radically saved, it, it's, a, it's an amazing reality. And watching God do that over and over and over is probably this pastor's greatest privilege and joy. I love to watch people go from a place of they know about God to they actually know God and are walking with him and experiencing him. Where they don't, they, they go from, because I think most of you know, the mandate on my life is to help people see differently. Because if you see differently, you'll think differently. If you think differently, you'll act differently. And we've gone from a place of the gospel of salvation that says one day we're going to leave this old world. You know what I mean? Pray this prayer, get your name in a book, and one day we're getting out of here too. Pray this prayer. Don't just bring, don't just incorporate Jesus into your life. Give Jesus your life and watch heaven come to earth because we have the right to believe for on earth as it is in heaven and as we see that happen that becomes that to me is the greatest mandate that we can possibly have is to help people see from that reality and see from that place so in that part watching people catch a hold of that and explode that to me is a miracle I, I love that I just have a couple more okay and we talked about you being married and we talked about you being in ministry but you're also parents so as parents, I would say that you did a pretty good job at raising kids who love Jesus, despite our mistakes, which Josh has made. <laughs> I, <laughs> um, I, would, I would say, and I'm, and, I'm, and I'm writing a book, shameless plug, Raising Jesus Loving Kids, because I think that that's an awesome message for the body of Christ, of what, especially if you grew up in a home that Jesus wasn't present 
maybe some tips or some advice or some just direction. How do you incorporate God in your everyday life? How, what is a great parenting tip for raising Jesus-loving kids? I would say mom. I, would say, uh, I know dad's the pastor here, but I would say I, I definitely learned more from mom. It might not have always been correct. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> But yeah, I, because when we were growing up, we had smaller churches, and uh, most of the time, mom was also our Sunday school teacher, so it was in our home. We played a lot of games and stuff like that, but I, I would say that she made sure that the word was instilled in us. Dad made sure the word was instilled in everyone. <laughs> so, so what would you say is a good tip for helping people to incorporate just incorporate Jesus all the time or raise Jesus-loving kids. What, what's the thing that you think you did well? I think it's make it a lifestyle. It should be the same in your home as it is in your job, as it is in the Walmart, as it is in this building, as it is in your car. I, it is a lifestyle. Um, whatever and whoever you are, here right now in this moment is who you should be with your children because your children is the most important thing you can do they are more important than your job they are more important than your new car or whatever else that's going on they're a living breathing being that you get the opportunity and the privilege to actually mold and and feel that vessel you get that opportunity to teach them I mean I, I love the teaching aspect and just sharing so every day you know whether it's you know a, a, a new scripture and you put it on the refrigerator and you say it before you go to school. You know, when Nicole and Josh went to school, we always prayed when they went to school. We prayed um, at night. But we prayed throughout the day. They came home from school and there was something going on. You know, and, it, and a prayer isn't, okay, let's, let's kneel down beside our bed and let's do this. A prayer is communication to Jesus. That's what prayer is. So you teach them that communication with Jesus is how you have a lifestyle. And it's just, it's just a lifestyle. It's an everyday part of who you are is you bring Jesus into your life, into your home, into everything that you do because he's our savior, he's our king. He's my best friend. He's my buddy protector. You know, he's my big brother. That's who Jesus is to me. I mean, this is who he is. And that's what I want my kids to know because when they're out there, whether they're, whether they're in public school or home school or Christian school, they're going to grow up and they're going to go out into a world. Your job is to prepare them for the world. And Jesus is who you prepare them about because he's your protector. He's your buddy. Mm -hmm. I think that's all the questions that I have. Oh, okay, and you know what? We've got three minutes. So that was pretty perfect. We were trying to wrap up at about 11.30, so that's really cool. Um, I'll have a couple closing thoughts, and then you can have a couple closing thoughts. Um, I, I want to first thank everybody for coming and for letting us be a panel and, and giving us questions and just doing life together and getting to know each other more. Um, there's lots of food out there and fun out there and blow-ups out there, and there's... Um, Things going on all day. If you look at your bulletin, there's a candy scramble and the tumble bus, which my amazing daughter owns for our little kids. There's um, uh, bingo and, and I don't know all the stuff going on. You have to look at your, at your um, timesheet on there. But um, there's, I do want to tell you if we have uh, our food that is out there is... Um, uh, ready the the staff has got it all ready for you we only have water available for you so if you really need a soda today you need to stop at the cafe and buy one from mr tom or whoever he has out there running his his cafe or a couple of them because the cafe will close today but if you want to buy a couple of them and and keep it with you if you do have to have that um 
little bit of uh, extra out there. But I, I'm just thrilled that so many came to share our day with us and, and to listen to us and just do life together because that's what it's about is, is just um, doing life and being family. So do you have some closing thoughts? All right, Pastor, you have three minutes to close us out. Sure. Okay. I have a whole lot of thoughts, but man, I, 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 love, I love the idea of doing life together. I love the idea of family and connectivity, and, and I feel like that that's probably one of the central focuses. Um, I'll share this with you. It's days like this that I think create connectivity. The month of July, the Lord put it on my heart. It's going to be Mission Matthew 25. And the whole month of July, we'll be doing outreaches. We're going to do outreaches throughout Hanover. We're going to do outreaches. We're targeting Hanover in the month of July. We'll use other communities later on. But right now, Mission Matthew 25 is going to look like this. We see it in Matthew 25. He said, I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me to drink. I was naked and you clothed me. I was in prison. You came and visited me. We're going to start looking at some of the areas. Uh, here's what we'll do. We'll have like an outreach day. And here's what the outreach day will look like. We'll get a whole bunch of people together, go two by twos with a garbage bag. We'll go through a, a, an area of Hanover, maybe a little rougher area, whatever, just start cleaning up garbage. Just start picking up, cleaning up the streets and touching things. As there's people outside, we'll be able to look at them. Hey, we're just in the area, just kind of cleaning up a little bit. Uh, man, we're just uh, walking through and praying for your community. Is there anything we could pray with you about? Well, people on the porch will wonder what you're up to, right? You get a chance to talk to them, share with them. We're, we're, not, uh, we're not trying to promote a church. We're trying to promote Jesus. At the same time, if they ask, we'd be more than glad to share with them. But we want to pray with them. We'll find ourselves praying for people and, and, and being able to clean up an area, make an impact, make a difference. At the same time, we'll have three or four grills laid out in, in, that, in that same area where we might do 500 hot dogs. And we're going to give them a bottle of water and a hot dog for free. All they're going to do is come in. And when we're doing that, again, get a chance to pray with them, touch them. Is there anything special we can do? And we're just going to bless areas of the community. So we're feeding them. We're cleaning around them. We're praying with them. We're touching them. Because I want to live in such a place that the people of our community are saying, we're glad Harvest Chapel's here. We're giving back to the community. We're making an impact. Mission Matthew 25. And we'll go to different places throughout the month. We'll be able to reach out to places because I feel like it's our opportunity to really touch our community. It's something I believe God's really put on our heart. But we'll see that. We'll, it may go on long past July, but it's the beginning of something that I feel because we need to be outreach-oriented and make a difference in our community. Okay? Cool. All right. Well, I want to thank you all for staying and for, for the amazing picnic that's happening. We've got so much fun stuff going out. And I wanted to take a minute to thank everybody who brought food. That Thank you for what you brought. Thank you for contributing. I did hear from the kitchen staff that there was some confusion. And I just want to clear that up right now because we don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. We love you and we appreciate you and we thank you. So some pe there were a few people who had brought some stuff that weren't on our menu. And we're prepared with the way that they have things set up and with the amount of electricity that they were using to plug in all the cookers to cooking the Sloppy Joe. They had things done a certain way so that they could manage everything. And frankly, the kitchen staff does an awesome job, and I don't want their job. So however they wanted to handle it, bless them and thank them. So we did have some confusion. Maybe you missed the, you know, missed the bulletin or missed the sign-up sheet and brought something that wasn't on our list. We appreciate it, and we have good news for you. You get to take that back home <laughs> because we do have things only set up um, to, to go the way that we're trying to do. And we're trying to give honor to the house and honor to the people who are in charge and who are cooking and, and, and making a lot of sacrifices of their time to try to pull this off for all of us. So if you did bring something that wasn't on the, wasn't on the menu, again, I thank you so much that you did, and I ask you to enjoy it at home. <laughs> But the rest of us are going to go, you know, we're going to go down and we're going to have a great time. We're going to have great food, great fun, great fellowship. If you would all stand with me, we're just going to dismiss you in prayer. Mm -hmm. Dear Lord, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for this time of community and connectivity. We thank you for the heads of this house that feel, feel the call on their hearts to be connected to one another and to be an open book for you, Lord, and to be an open book with the people, Lord. God, I thank you for what you're doing in this church and how you're ministering to us and how you're growing us and the plans that you have for our future, Lord. I thank you for what you're doing. I thank you for the food and for the cooks that prepared it and for everyone who contributed. And I thank you for the amazing weather and the amazing time that you have in store for us today. God, I thank you for what you're already doing, and I thank you for promises of even more in the future. 
future. We love you and we give you all the glory and we look forward to celebrating with you and with one another today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, before you go, if you have children, in interest of our answer to our question for background checks, if you have children, we will not release them unless you go pick them up. So go pick your children up before you go picnicking at the individual classrooms. All right? Thank you, guys. This does not mean you can leave them there. You must <laughs> sign them out. <laughs>